Hello everyone, it's Jeff again, and um, so we're continuing on with this uh, long stretch of uh, videos. I guess we've had about three videos so far that are all sort of building toward um, having some sort of physics application in SDL. And we almost got there last time, except right toward the end of our session, we had some bugs. And um, I'm glad that we got to sort of delve into some of the debugging tools with uh, breakpointing and just using prints to like figure out what's going on. Um, but I'm going to, uh, now that we've got everything sort of up and working again, take the opportunity to uh, get ahead with uh, actually doing some of the physics stuff that we were looking to do and um, making sure that we have like a good working simulation. So if I run this, we should have um, a little circular thing that goes to the right. I'm pretty sure that's basically what happens here. Yeah, great. So that will be our planet. So that's moving at one meters per second to the right. Um, that's cool. So um, in order to uh, turn this into the sort of physics simulation that we're looking for, the gravity simulation that we're looking for, uh, there's a couple of things that we probably need to do. First of all, I want to make sure that we actually have two different uh, textures loaded, one for the star and one for the body. Uh, right now we have just this texture. Um, I'm going to make a second one of these so that we have um, planet texture and star texture. So we've got two of those in service here. And um, so the major thing that's basically going to change here is that we have to change texture to planet texture wherever it's currently appearing. That was silly. I'm just going to go backwards here. Um, what I should have done is used F2. The reason that I commented out this other one, by the way, was because it was also named Texture, which would possibly confuse IntelliSense, because it's just a new variable, like it's not an existing one. We had sort of like clobbered the name there, so I'm just going to start using Star Texture as well here. Um, so I'm going to do basically the same thing rendering here. Um, so also this render position, I'm going to make this called planet render position. So I'm just going to expand this out a little bit. And so this second one that I am creating here, so I'm going to use star texture. And I'm going to create a star render position that we're going to compute there. Um, and I'll just put that in here. And so that will just be star body position, right? So when we're rendering our planet, we're rendering our star. Um, so lastly, I'm going to give a little bit of, um, I guess I need to pull in the things that I need in order to be able to draw my star. So I'm just going to put star.ping here. I'm pretty sure that's what the image is called. Um, make sure that loads into star texture. And um, I think I'm going to change the positions of some things just a little bit here. I don't want to give any velocity to the star. Um, and I'm just going to world add body star body okay so I'm gonna say that the star has a mass of 10 um, yeah I I don't know we'll we'll figure we'll figure it out um, let me see what I have in my demo currently that will help me a little bit right so I set the positions of these things and 
just to keep things a little bit simpler, I'm going to use the two-dimensional coordinate um, form for this because it automatically makes Z zero. So I'm just going to punch in the numbers that I had from my, my demo before. So I had a star at zero, zero, and I had a planet body at negative four, negative three with a mass of one, and the star has a mass of ten. Um, yeah, okay. So, load the star. Okay, so let's see what we get now. We should have both of these two things rendering. Um, and, oh, something like this. Um, hmm. The multiplication specifically that it's not cool with. Um, hmm, okay. Oh, yeah, that's an issue. I didn't actually create a new star body, I just reassigned to planet body, so um, obviously when I added star body to the world, like it wasn't set up at all, and everything went south. Uh, yeah, so that's just make sure that this is set to star body. Let's try that again. Yeah, all right. Okay, so that's progress. It's not orbiting or anything, but that's progress. So at this point, we have the ability to sort of render things with position and with velocity. Um, it's really just a matter of figuring out what we need to do in order to make the gravitational effects come together. So um, I'm going to assume, I'm, I'm recording this in advance, I'm going to sort of assume that we have covered the equation for gravity, which looks something like this. Uh, so you have force is equal to the gravitational constant times the mass of one object times the mass of the second object over the radius between them squared. That's that's our equation that we're sort of working from here. This is the this is what makes the magic. Um, so what we want to do is compute a force to apply to the planet based on these factors: the mass of the star, the mass of the planet, the radius between them, and some gravitational constant. Um, at some point, I'm eventually going to try like pretty realistic values for this and I'll show you what it looks like if you actually sort of plug numbers in for like the sun and the earth and you know using the actual value of g and like the actual distance of earth from the sun like there's you can you can simulate it out although you're going to find that there's a little it's a little bit shaky it won't be exactly right you might have to tune the values just a little bit so okay now i'm putting this under gameplay code because basically what i'm saying here is that the nature of this game is that and it's not really a game yet it's just like some little simulation i guess is that each frame some force is going to be applied that causes this gravitational effect that sort of comes together here. So that's that's all that, that's happening here. So what do we need to be able to do? Um, I For something like this, I like to be able to sort of comment out what, what my sort of plan of attack is. And um, so we're going to have to do like a little bit of vector math here to, to get at... Um, what we what we need to be able to get a force vector that's pointing in exactly the right direction we have to do a little bit of work um, to come up with that so what do we need right like we're going to need a force vector that points from the planet toward the star right because if we're applying force to the planet and the force is acting toward the center of the star then we need a vector that goes from the center of one to the center of the other and specifically from the center of the planet to the center of the star but we're going to need to have that vector normalized we want it to have a length of one because 
When you normalize a vector, effectively what you're doing is prying out the direction from it. Like so, um, let's let's state this as a couple of things. Get the um, vector from the center of the planet to the center of the star. normalize the vector to get only its direction. So yeah, normalizing basically, since it gets you a vector of length one, you can multiply that against kind of whatever, um, using it basically as a direction for, for some scalar magnitude. Um, this is a pretty common thing that you'll see. Um, very often we get a vector from one thing to another and then we'll normalize it to get the direction or we'll use length to get the magnitude. And then we've got those two components of the vector separated apart. So it's length and it's magnitude can sort of be like broken up and or it's um, direction and it's magnitude can sort of be broken up. And when its direction is available on its own, then you can multiply other scalar values by that. Usually you'll find this in movement code where um, like you'll get a direction based on the in inputs, whether that be the controller or mouse and keyboard. Um, and you'll use a direction um, that might be normalized and then you'll incorporate some speed value for your character that, that will determine like how fast they move or something. There's a very sort of simple movement process. But so what we want is then to um, yeah um, actually I guess we're probably going to want to um, get the length of the vector um, to find r right because I guess the distance from the center of the planet to the center of the star is going to be r in this equation and then lastly find the applied force by computing this equation okay so this is basically all the stuff that we're we're sort of interested in doing here. So getting the vector from the center of the planet to the center of the star. Basically to do this you just need to remember this is all about subtracting vectors, right? Because you're taking the position of one thing and subtracting the position from the other thing because subtraction the result of subtraction gives you a difference, right? And so really what we're talking about is get the difference from the center of the planet to the center of the star, right? So I'm gonna make a vector three variable here and I'm gonna call it planet to star. Uh, I would really rather have slightly longer variable names that are descriptive um, than anything else. So that's what I'm gonna call that. And if you remember, you need to subtract the, um, basically you're subtracting the tail of the vector from the head. So wherever you want the tip, like the directionality of the vector to point toward um, should be the first object that you're looking at. So we want the star because we want the force vector to point toward the star's center. And then we're going to subtract away planet body position. So that's going to give us a direction to go. Um, or in this is oops, and planner to star. Let's not do that. Okay, so we have planet to star. Cool. Let's space this out just a little bit. Um, sure. Now, if I want the direction, Um, then that is as simple as uh, planet to star. Oops, that's not a pointer. 
uh, normalize. So that's that's all that is. So normalize is really really straightforward. Now, so now getting the length of the vector to find r, I could do right. So I could do something like float radius is equal to um, planet to star dot length. But this is exactly the case that I was talking about. You notice how there is r squared here? Well, we set ourselves up for this in advance. Length squared works perfectly for this. Um, you don't need to do this, but it's a pretty common trick that you'll see that game developers use to avoid square roots um, when, when you would be able to use this here. So it's pretty helpful. It's good. Um, and then I guess um, let's, uh, let's get the force. So I have some gravitational constant, which I guess I'm going to have to kind of make up um, for this. I'm going to add that as a define before I go ahead with this. I'm just going to throw it in here on top, and for now I'm just going to set it to exactly 1. Um, it's a lot smaller than 1. Uh, it's like times 10 to the power of 11th. It's a really, really small number in reality, but we'll sort that out. So, okay, so this force is basically, it's this, right? Um, so this is going to get us a magnitude, and then we're going to have to multiply that by the direction. So we'll have force times direction that we're applying in the end, which I guess is going to then be um, apply the force along the direction to the center of the star. Or apply force along the okay so now I have my gravitational constant which I made to be equal to 1 and I'm just going to multiply that by let's say the star is object 1 it doesn't matter what order it goes in it doesn't make any difference but so star body mass times planet body mass divided by radius squared. Now, you could, of course, like because planet to star length squared is pretty straightforward, you could just as easily do this. Um, that's my preference personally because it's like it's just so sort of simple and eventually you learn to sort of be able to read this as radius, I think. Um, so, I mean, it's up to you how many lines of code you want to use on this, um, but I'm going to leave it expanded out in this form um, because, like, that's probably the most comfortable way to read it. So lastly, we just need to apply some force, right? So I'm just going to apply force to the planet for now. Technically, both the planet and the star exert force on one another. Um, but let's just let's just see how this works first. So we're going to apply force to center of direction times force. I want to point out we were using vector threes throughout this, and notice how naturally all of this math flows um, because of how we designed vector three and the operator overloads that we set up. Um, all of our vector operations are really just melting into the math nicely. They don't look awkward. They're not hard to follow. Um, we can just, you know, subtract a couple, like multiply against a scalar. All that stuff flows pretty naturally, and it feels pretty good. So I'm curious to see if this is going to work correctly. I think it probably should. It looks like my rendering code is in place for this, and it looks as though I'm re loading my stuff. Yeah, like I think it's probably going to at least work. So let's try it out. 
okay this is good all right so look at that we have like a very very elliptical orbit but we have something so okay this is pretty cool um yeah all right that's pretty awesome so um now I'm a little curious what it would be like to try to use like real numbers for this. So what I'm going to do is uh, why don't we uh, why don't we take a look at Wikipedia? Um, so let's load up the article for Earth, and I'll load up the article for the Sun. Okay, so let's learn some things about the Earth and the Sun. Um, okay, so the aphelion and parhelion, perihelion are the um, statements of the furthest and the nearest that the Earth is from the Sun. Um, so now you'll notice that these hover very close to 1 AU, so that's sort of our like standard measurement for so this is along this this semi major axis which frankly I don't know exactly what that means but um, so the one AU is a measure of this um, and so it's a hundred and forty nine point six million kilometers that's a fairly big number but okay, we can convert that into meters with a few more zeros attached to the end. So like why don't we why don't we try this? So let's say earth mass. So okay, obviously commas are no good. Zero zero zero. So that would give that to me in meters. Now I think I would prefer to have this in scientific notation form, because this is nuts. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, to the power of 11. Um, so if you're curious, it is possible to write scientific notation form floats like this. So one point some number of decimal places e to the 11. So this is saying to the exponent of the 11th power as a float. That's how that reads. Um, now, I don't actually have the ability to store exactly all of that accuracy, but it's it's pretty good. So, um, now, what does the sun's mass come to? The sun's mass is going to be huge. Um, so let's take a look. Sun's article Oh, what was I thinking? That's the distance. Uh, yeah, my bad. Let's, um, let's say this is Earth radius. What was I thinking? Okay, Earth radius, and then we'll get Earth mass in a moment. So, okay, so let's figure that out. So, the Earth's mass... is surface area mass. Okay, here we go. Uh, 5.97237 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. All right, that's a freaking big number. But a floating point can handle that, believe it or not. So I'm just going to adjust that to be E24F. So that's the Earth's mass as a real value. And for the sun, its mass is going to be amazingly big. Um, okay, so I'm going to call that 1.98855 times 10 to the 30th power. That's actually approaching the biggest number that a floating point number can represent. Um, but we're still good. Believe it or not, floating point numbers can handle that. Um, and, oh yeah, I suppose I should ask for that. Uh, gravitational constant. I've done this before and Google's pretty good about it. Sweet, thanks Google. Alright, cool. 
Whoa, those units are insane. I forgot how weird they were. Um, all right, cool. So let's plug that in. Uh, so obviously I'm gonna have to adjust that. So now for something that's to a negative power, you can just say E negative 11 in this case. So that works. So this is saying 6.67408 times 10 to the power of negative 11. So I think these are all the numbers that I need. Um, but I'm going to have to adjust my simulation just a tiny bit because when I position my planets, I'm probably going to need to put it some fair distance away. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say Earth radius and I'm going to place it at the center on the x-axis. So, or actually, let's put it negative. So this is going to be at the bottom of the screen, Earth radius distance away from the center and so by that I mean you know like one and a half somewhere in the many billions of meters from yeah so uh, I think I'm gonna have to change the region that my camera renders because right now it's only rendering 16 meters across so I'm gonna have to upgrade that to you know, somewhere in the territory of 300 billion meters across or something to be able to see what's going on here. So, you know, minor change, but it's, uh, you know, it's no big deal. So uh, I'm going to throw in the Earth's mass here because I want that to have that mass and I want the sun to have the sun's mass. So, um... And then I've got my gravitational constant. I think everything else is basically in a good shape for this. It's just that I'm going to have to readjust the camera. Um, so if I know that I'm going to be at least this far away. Um, so this is my min y is negative this value or negative earth radius. So let's... Um, Sure. Uh, yes, you can totally do this. This is valid. Uh, so uh, you can you can just make like a thing multiplying from that. So I don't know exactly what that is. I'm, it's going to be like 1.7-ish or something like that. Um, but I'm just doing this so that um, I get something a little bit bigger than the Earth's radius so that I can sort of follow the motion of the Earth around, around the sun. Or maybe let's give it a little bit more padding. Let's call it one and a half. Um, and, ooh, yeah, so two, so this is six units of Earth radius across, can I, okay, I'm just going to have to compute for whatever the aspect ratio is here, um, yeah, it's a little bit challenging. Okay, so the x-axis is the wider one, so I'm going to do 16 divided by 9. Sorry, I'm just doing this by calculator. Um, times 6. So if I have a width of 6, then I want 10 and a third. So I guess 5 and a third for each of these. That's a little bit awkward, but whatever, we'll go with it. So, um, really all that's happening here is, so this is like 16 over 9 times, oh wait, this is only 3 across. My mistake, let me adjust. Um, hmm, this gives us sort of an awkward number, but, um, and so, okay, I'm just going to allow the aspect ratio to be a little bit weird. Uh, I just want to see if this is working more than anything. So let's try this. This is this is basically we now have a two to one aspect ratio because our screen is six wide and three tall. Well, six times Earth radius wide and three times Earth radius tall. So it might be stretched slightly. 
Uh, I don't think the textures will stretch, but the aspect ratio would be a little bit weird um, of the background. So let's let's run this and see if anything happens. A little bit surprised by the planet's initial position. So let me take a quick look at what that should be. Um, yeah, so this should be centered around zero and the star sort of indicates that negative earth radius on the y-axis but the x-axis is set to zero so it should really be in the middle um hmm. you'll notice that basically nothing's moving because um one meter per second in this scale is really 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 small so i'm just gonna crank this number up like by a huge amount and see if i can sense any motion Um, honestly, I'm not entirely sure that I am. This is crazy. Yeah, I don't know. I think by now I probably should have experienced some motion. So, um, I feel like maybe something weird is going on. Okay, so to start off with, my planet body is drawing to a pretty weird location on screen. So, I guess my first concern is what is my planet body position um, coming up with? So, let's try this uh, debugging business again. So, I want to see planet body um oh well this says some bad things so there is definitely some kind of issue here uh with planet body because position and velocity are both giving me like total garbage um all right um hmm so the catch then is trying to figure out where exactly everything turns into garbage. Um, the world's update is maybe a good place to look. So I'll just set that and I'll see if I can sort of spot anything coming in. So right now it claims that acceleration is effectively infinity. It's giving me not negative not a number uh, indeterminate, infinite for y. Um, so, okay, well, obviously my acceleration is borked somehow, so um, that suggests to me that my body's acceleration function maybe has a problem. So let's look in there. Okay, so the force being applied is infinite, so then that means that my gravitational code has a problem because that's where I'm computing that. So, um, sure, if I stop applying this force here, um, does, it, does it move to the correct location? Well, uh, I'm just going to let this go for now. Take out these other breakpoints because I don't desperately need them. Okay, so now it actually appears basically in the correct location. Great. So what's wrong with what I'm doing in my math here? Um, I suspect that... Um, radius squared could actually be the issue here. So I'm going to break point this very line. Let's see. Radius squared? No, it's okay. Um mass I bet you when you multiply these two numbers together the floating point number breaks I'm curious let me see 
So I'm just going to make a temporary number here. I, I'm just going to mash these things together and like I, I just want to see um, what what some of these pieces kind of add up to. I'll let the breakpoint hit. I'll look at that. Okay, so these two things multiplied together produce infinity. Well, why would that be? These are big numbers, really big. Um, so this planetary, like real value planetary systems like this do actually start to strain what we can do with floats. Um, so floating point numbers can, um, let me look up this, IEEE floating point. Uh, sure, this is, or I don't want some random dude's site actually. Give me a Wikipedia, please. Sure, so let me see. There's probably a thing that will specify this. So, a single precision floating point number. Um, this has basically... Now, I mean, this is a little bit rough, but in decimal, um, you're more or less going to encounter a maximum of the 38th power. Like, that is as high as you can go um, on an IEEE-defined um, single precision number. And things break down after that. If you go over that, then it can't treat the number properly. So what you may find that you need to do if you're doing calculations with extremely big numbers like this is that you want to convert the numbers to doubles um, kind of while you're um, while you're dealing with this and allow them to sort of convert back into floats so um, I'm gonna do this calculation again this a I so I'm gonna I'm gonna let this breakpoint one more time and I'm gonna see if a gives me a different result here uh, nope that's still infinity it doesn't like that um, Oh, well, I mean, I suppose that's true, because what I'm setting A to is definitely bigger than what a float can hold. So if I made A a double, what would it be? Okay, so basically the problem that I'm having here is that I am multiplying a number to the 55th power, and that is just, the result of that is just too, too large. Um, so let's try actually just making every one of these things a double, um, for kicks, um, and hopefully that will mean that at the end of the day force computes correctly. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this because that was just for demonstration. Let's see what we get. I moved this breakpoint down, by the way, because, um, the breakpoint doesn't run the line of code that you're on. So if I were here, um, force wouldn't get computed, so it would be stopped. So I, I moved to the next line so that I could see what force was. So I got 3.541 times 10 to the power of 22. And that uh, that feels a lot better. Um, you'll notice that this is still a float, and this is okay because the end result is still less than times 10 to the power of 38. But we needed to use doubles in the math here to prevent the floating point math from breaking down in the middle. Otherwise, everything has problems. So this is a case where you kind of need to resort to doubles because you need the like you need that level of mathematical precision uh, to be able to deal with this. So looking back to this table again. Um, that I was looking at briefly. So a double, so binary 64, can handle numbers up to the power of 307. Um, yes, there are bigger types that exist, but I can't even imagine a number being times 10 to the power of 78,913. I don't know about you, but um, double is plenty for most of the things that I would be interested in, and single will do most of the work. Uh, this is one of the rare times that I even need to delve into double to get things done, and uh, it has done just fine. So hopefully our force computes like more or less the way that it's supposed to now. Okay, so it's a real number, right? Like, oh, okay, the line that applies the force is not set, so there's one thing. 
But I have a feeling that this is still not going to move, or at least not very much. I'll get rid of that breakpoint. Okay, it does move. Um, it, it does actually move. But it's going extremely slow. And why is that? Well, if we're simulating accurately, it does take the Earth 365 and a quarter days to go around the sun. I'm not going to sit and watch your simulation for quite that long, so uh, we might have to speed this up a little bit. So why don't we do that? Um, I'm going to go back to the clock. Um, I made a couple little minor adjustments to the clock um, since last time we looked at it. It's basically the same. We still have our start function here. The major thing that I did is I added in a little thing here so that if for any reason you forget to call start, instead of crashing the game, it will um, simply automatically call start and the first frame will be zero length because, of course, um, CPU ticks most recent will have counted the performance counter at the same time as CPU ticks current, so delta ticks should end up being zero. Um, but it's better than crashing the game, so, so I threw this little thing in. But what we're going to add this time around is we're going to incorporate time scaling. Now, if you've used Unity, you may have run into time.timescale. So this is a number that you can set on the time object in Unity uh, that results in time being multiplied by this factor. So if you set it to 0.1, then time goes by 10% as fast. And if you set it to 10, then time goes by 10 times as fast. So for a situation like this, we definitely want to make sure that the clock is moving ahead at like mega fast forward, right? So um, I'm going to add in just a couple of little things here. You'd be surprised uh, how little you really need to add in order to accomplish this. So I'm going to throw in time scale. And um, I'm going to add in versions of each of these variables. Oops. So delta microseconds. Actually, let's just copy all of these and then I'll just add unscaled after each of them. So unscaled, the reason that I'm doing this is because I want to be able to get times out of this out of this clock for um, for both the scaled and unscaled time. Um, why? Uh, basically my answer to this is that UI usually doesn't change now, I mean, obviously, I'm not making a UI, but if I were making a clock that is any good, I would want it to be able to support this sort of thing, where my UI basically animates at a set rate regardless of how fast the game speed is set. I want to be able to adjust things that use delta time to manipulate like how fast things are going on, but I also want to be able to completely throw away that scaling so that I don't really have to think about it. Um, so, of course, uh, this we're going to have um, a whole bunch of new variables that we need to zero out here because all of these times we want to make sure that those are zero to start with. And um, with the exception of time scale, which um, to start off with, I think it makes plenty of sense that the default time scale would be set to 1. Um, sorry, I'm just going to put these into alphabetical order because that's how I like to work. Um, okay, so we've got we've got all this business in place. That's all good. Um, now we're going to need to adjust our update slightly because now we've got a few more variables that we need to fill. Up until this point, we've been filling delta and elapsed microseconds, delta and elapsed seconds, but now we need to uh, pull a little bit of a switcheroo um, to make sure that we're sort of doing the computed or the unscaled ones. Um, so actually, when we look at this, we are in fact actually, um, oh yeah, I don't want to F2 that, that's a bad idea. 
Um, so I'm going to be uh, using unscaled for these ones because I'm ha at this point I'm com I'm measuring the real time and I haven't applied any time scaling value to these. So these are all the unscaled values. And so um so let's throw in time scaling at the end here. Um and basically what we're going to do is um we, we go about computing them more or less in the same way. It's just that, um, so delta microseconds unscaled um, computes this. So we're just gonna lean on delta microseconds unscaled, multiply it by the time scale. We get elapsed microseconds by adding to delta, so adding um, delta microseconds that has been scaled here. And then we can just convert delta microseconds and elapsed microseconds into seconds um, for delta seconds and elapsed seconds. So that gives us like all the stuff that we need in order to be able to um, read out values that have been scaled by the time scaling factor. So basically all I need to do in order to use this is I'm just going to throw a statement in here to um, speed up time. Let's say clock dot um, time scale is equal to I don't know 100 that seems like a good value to start off with let's try it um, this velocity of set for earth I have no idea if this is insanely large or insanely small I, I, I really don't know um, we'll work that out in a moment um, we'll try and come up with something so I don't know let's run it does the time scale appear to work hey that's a pretty good sign um, it probably still needs to move a little faster than this but uh, it feels pretty good all right so let's try a thousand let's see what a thousand gives us come on computer you can do it save that file like you mean it All right, okay, so I'm gonna bet that that velocity that I set was possibly huge. Um, it also seems like the gravitational effect that the star had on the planet was very small, uh, at least comparatively. So, um, okay, I'm curious, if I go to Earth, can I get a value for like how fast it's actually orbiting is it average oh. my bad um okay so they have an average orbital speed at 107,200 kilometers per hour um okay so we can work with this or 29.78 kilometers per second is more useful, I suppose. I can convert 29.78 into meters per second, and that should give us a good number to start off with here. So let's try. I'll just say define Earth speed. Okay, so 29.78 if we add three zeros, that turns into meters. Um, so now this would be one, two, three, four. Yeah. So if I want to put this into scientific notation, I got 2.9000. Oh, my mistake. Zero, zero, zero. That should go at the end. Um, times 10 to the power of four, is it? All right. So let's give that a shot. Uh, I'll have to put Earth speed into my math. It seems as though the number I have in here is huge, uh, which would maybe account for why gravity didn't really seem to be acting on the Earth. Uh, it may mean that I have to jack up my time scale even more. We'll see. Okay, so obviously this is moving very, very slowly. 
Um, so, all right, let's let's just boost the time scale like crazy. Let's see what happens here. Wow. All right, give it another ten. I did not expect this, but we've got a time scale of one million now. All right. This feels pretty good. I have no idea whether this simulation is going to be, like, accurate or not. Um, but it's feeling pretty good right now, to be honest. Like, it might still sort of, like, crash into the star after a couple orbits or something, but... Honestly, it looks like it's behaving pretty pretty well. Uh, this is actually better than my first attempt at using real values. Uh, this has turned out actually really very nicely. Um, so, um, just for the sake of um, seeing, let's let's give it one more times ten, just so that we can watch this happen in fast mode for a little while. So there you go. That's uh, the Earth's orbit around the sun at 10 million times fast forward. That's what that looks like. So um, I'm going to say I'm at about 50 minutes. This seems like a pretty great stopping point. Um, so now that we've come this far, um, I mostly want for you to be focusing on um, cleaning up your code, making, making for nicer code. So this is, um, I'm going to show you some tricks about how we can sort of reorganize our code to make, like pack everything up into like nice reusable chunks and leave only sort of the, the few pieces, uh, that we need for this application. Uh, outside of the nice like reusable chunks and then if you follow through on all that stuff when it comes to assignment four you're gonna have a whole bunch of classes that you can just kind of drop in and use so um, yeah uh, hopefully it will be a pretty big help and um, yeah I'll see you in the next one